curious about your personal experience. Can you share an example of a text from Scripture where you might have enjoyed this artistic experience you're talking about or intimations of transcendence? No. <laughs> um, no. Uh, I, I've had it more when I've started reading this book, researching this book. Um, for me, um, Scripture was very worrisome. As Catholics, we didn't read it much. Um, but I... I I was, um, I, I, it worried me. And I did a lot of academic work on scripture and you know, found out when this was written and when that was written. And, and so it all became rather academic. I learned to look at, I was talking about it to some of you earlier, at, at all these texts in a different way. When I read a, a footnote in a big book about Islam, which talked about the science of compassion, that you have to put yourself in the shoes of others. Um, and I, for me, um, learning about other people's scriptures have helped me to see what my own scripture was trying to do at, at, at its best. I was, I was so worried about my own wretched salvation that all these texts seemed to be condemning me or showing how imperfect I was and, uh, and all these prophets fulminating away about this and that. Uh, I, I, I found it disturbing, except, except when uh, we sang it in the convent, uh, we did the, the, we had the Gregorian chant, and that adds a whole new dimension to it, uh, because it was that's how it's meant to be read or sung, or uh, that's that's how it's it's not just a cerebral et attitude. There was one text that was sung in Holy Week. Uh, Christ was made obedient to us, even unto death on a cross. And the, 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 the song, the plain song of that, uh, really, really touches and, and, and touches uh, the unthinking part of the self. Um, so I think we have to remember that, that, that scripture is an, meant to be sung. And so uh, or, or, or chanted, and you have to have that, that dimension. When, when Muslims chant the Quran, it creates a sense of great sadness and sorrow. Uh, 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 I think they call it huzn, um, which you can't just get by running your eyes over the page, uh, because it touches, the, it touches another part of the brain. So it, I, for me, I suppose, reading scripture was always a rather terrifying experience. But reading other people's scriptures somehow and seeing the immense struggle to find meaning in a life that could easily be seen as meaningless, especially in, when you're living as the Aryan Indians were in 1500 BCE, a life of danger and con constantly just attacking other people to get enough food for today. Uh, and uh, constantly feeling in battle, yet they have these extraordinary visions of the cosmos. Uh, speaking about singing and practice, you, I was struck by your metaphor. Practice with scripture is like reading an opera libretto. We're missing the singing. We're missing half of it. So what should we, what could we be doing differently? It's hard to get that back, I think, especially in the Protestant world. Um, and, and, the, and the Catholicism has become extremely Protestantized, I think, um, and we, we, in, in, in this way. How, sh how can we get that back? Um, I think by looking at Scripture as a mandate for action. Hmm. Uh, because it's not just a question of reading your Scripture and, having an, and finding the Lord is my shepherd, um, and that, how lovely that is. And, and so you get a nice warm glow. Uh, it's uh, 
you have also to take into the fact that a lot of scripture is quite disturbing. Um, we found that in the convent when we had to swap from chanting the uh, office, which covered the whole Psalter in Latin, and do it in English. Now, some of the Psalms and some of the sisters were very excited about this because they found the Latin incomprehensible. I could do the Latin, but I, and I could see there were problems ahead uh, because not all, it, not all the Psalms are lovely and sweet. I mean, uh, we all found ourselves, imagine a room like this filled with polite English disciplined nuns warbling politely, Oh God, smash their teeth in their mouths. <laughs> uh, and that's what we did. We just corpsed and fell about. But what we, and I didn't know how to deal with this. And the only way we could, could deal with it was going back to chanting it and not taking any notice of what it was saying. And that's not as daft as it looks because uh, you're, it's not all about you. We, you know, we, we, uh, in those days, I was applying all this to me. But in fact, the Psalms are the voice of humanity. Uh, and humanity is violent. We talk about things being evil, and we have we've created a Satan to imagine how evil got into the world, but we are evil. We're the only creatures that are evil. Animals aren't evil. Uh, but we and we have these big brains that enable us to harm other people. So scriptures have to have that violence in them, and we have to sort of remember the way this is not just a where we are human beings. Uh, they, if they, the scriptures reflect us and our violent moments, where we all feel we'd like to smash someone's teeth in their mouths occasionally, um, and. Acknowledge that within yourself, but acknowledge it as a, a human tray, um, as, as well as the, the great ecstasies and, and goodness and kindness that we have, and see our complexity. So I think we need to see the scriptures not just as applying to me personally, but to be a record of, of what it means to be a human being, was all these scriptures show violence and terror because that is part of the human life and part of the human existence. Every time we turn on the news, uh, we see these awful things. Uh, you're emphasizing to act. Um, how do you derive from, say, the New Testament, the need to act on climate change, for example? It's not very good, on, as I say, the, the Indians and the Chinese are better on this. I think we need to go to the Psalms uh, for that, or some, some of the prophecies. Um, the Quran has some verses, though, that are good. Uh, they're called the sign verses, um, whereby you're told to look at the wonders of creation. And it constantly tells you, just think at about this, just think about that, to, to think and contemplate it. Uh, the New Testament isn't so hot on, 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 on climate change, but now we don't need to just confine ourselves to our own scriptures. We've got the insights of the Confucians as well. We've got the writings of the new Confucians, uh, the wisdom of, of, of the Indian sages who, who thought about that. And we've got the Psalms and we've got the Quran. I'm just trying to rack my brains. I can't really think of many. Um, uh, it, for, for, for Jesus, it's more about su suffer, human suffering that we see there, uh, hu what human beings do to one another, uh, to take that pain in, into our hearts, as well as, as seeing uh, Jesus transfigured, uh, and as the human, being, human beings could be transfigured. Uh, you know, that there's a moment where they see him shining like the sun, etc., almost in a Buddha-like pose. And this is human beings being, I think, having that potential. We've got that there, but we've also got a bad potential too. We also nail people to crosses. 
and and uh, and, and injure them, and and or else, and are not concerned. We've got this habit these days. I don't know whether you do it in the United States, but when we're watching the news. Uh, when the, something unpleasant is about to happen, the newscaster is now obliged to say a warning. You may find this upsetting or distressing, which gives you a chance to go and make a cup of tea or switch channels, anything to block out yet another suffering that image. That but we should take these into our into our minds and hearts, and the scriptures tell us to do that. A uh, fascinating start in your book. You start with ancient cave art, 40,000 years old, a carved statue of something called Lion Man. Were the beginnings of art the beginnings of religion? I think the two are one. I think religion is an art form. I'll tell you about Lion Man, those of you who haven't read this thick book already. Um, the, the, it, we had we we borrowed this from a German in the British Museum and and had him in an exhibition recently. It was most moving. He's thirty one centimeters high. Uh, discovered in southern Germany shortly before the outbreak of World War II, uh, and he's got the head of a cave lion, which was the big, biggest predator of this region of southern Germany. Uh, they, 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 the people who lived in this cave would have been terrified of the cave lion. But he's got a partly human body. And so they fused the two together. And clearly, this uh, has been, uh, you can see that he's been stroked uh, and as though he were passed around in worship while uh, people told, well, told his story. And it's important because people, we see that the people who made that 40,000 years ago um, were, had the ability to, imagine, to think of something that did not exist. And I was invited to open that exhibition. And I said, you know, that this, uh, that, that this is the beginning of religion, too, because it was a, it was a, this was an exhibition about religion, that we have the ability to think of what does not exist, uh, like God, I said. And then I'm going, everyone was going, I said, you don't, don't get upset. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, I am about to say that God does not exist, but so did Thomas Aquinas. God, he said, is not one of the things that exist. God is esse ipsum, being itself. Uh, and uh, we have the, the capacity to think of, transcend, of transcending ourselves and overcoming our terror of this beast and seeing human and, and animal as, as, as one. As, as, as one and, and, and as beautiful and as divine. You see it also in the Lascaux Caves, which are the later where the local animals of the region are presented in, in, as numinous creatures. And there's one that also fuses animal and human together. That we, and again, something that we need, we need to be aware of uh, that as we're massacring species, uh, you know, for, for just for our own uh, gluttony. Uh, do you still call yourself a freelance monotheist? No, and, I don't. And, and what's I wish I'd never, I don't know, I once made that remark in a light-hearted way, and it dogs my heels all the time. Uh, 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 because I, uh, it, I, I would no longer say I was just a monotheist. I've since I've looked at other scriptures, other works, other, other where, where they don't, believe in one God. Uh, they have a load of gods, all pointing in different ways to the transcendent divine. Um, I'm curious, what's, what's the basis for your belief in God? Is it based in scripture or something else? Uh, belief, I think, is a, a grossly unhelpful world, word. And I discussed this last time I was in Houston with you. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was, uh, you know, we, we, the word belief, we, it's now become, we, you've got to believe in God, you've got to believe in this, and the word belief, it means 
it's come to mean the acceptance of a rather dubious proposition. Uh, but the word beneath originally, beleva, it meant to love, uh, to commit yourself. Uh, Chaucer's knight says to his lady, accept of my believer, accept my loyalty, my fealty, my love. Um, and credo, I, of Latin for crade, uh, I believe, mean, meant, came from a cordare, cor to give your heart. Um, and uh, faith meant loyalty too. Uh, the, 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 so there was St. Anselm, whom I give quite a bad press to in this book, uh, but he, he had, uh, he once said, credo ut intelligam, I believe in order th that I may understand. That's how we always pronounced it. Uh, but it shouldn't, uh, and I always thought you had to bludgeon your mind to accept all these impossible doctrines. And, uh, and then if you could just still that critical faculty and say, yes, I believe in three in one and God in three, uh, the, uh, then I would understand. I'd have pushed myself into a different mode of thought. Nonsense. He wasn't saying any such thing. Credo meant I commit myself. And then I will understand. I will behave in a certain way. Um, in, and that will evoke new understanding in me. The word changed its meaning, believer, belief, in the 18th century. And it came to mean the acceptance of a rather dubious proposition. And one of the first people to use it in this sense uh, was, was uh, Isaac Newton, the great scientist who wrote to a friend saying that when, I, when he discovered the holus, what he thought was the solar system, he said it was in my mind that it would give discerning people uh, food for belief in a deity, for accepting something that was uh, logical. Uh, and, and, and since then, uh, we, 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 we now made belief in absolute fetish. Credo in unum deum meant, didn't mean I believe in one God. It meant I commit myself to the trans, this transcendent reality that, I, that I'll, I, I'll never know. I, and if I do know it, I've created an idol in my own image and likeness. Uh, and, and that, that, that uh, commitment uh, also, as we know from Scripture, means a concern for justice, a cons and you look for it in every human being. You look for it in the cosmos. You look for it in in every the possibility in every single human being, um, and so I think that's where my faith or be belief is. Um, I was used to be terrorized by this idea of some large deity who could look into my heart, knew everything I'd done or thought. Uh, he often seemed to be angry. Um, I sent his son down and got him crucified. And uh, this, I was not looking forward to heaven. Uh, but the other place seemed worse. Um, and, and, but but it, it was very hard uh, to, 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 to live with this deity. But it, it, it's a monstrous idea. This is some kind of bo uh, very depleted notion of, 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 God, of the divine. Um, and just as uh, Lion Man it was, the fu was the fusion of both humanity and animal, um, it, 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 the, the, our, our notion of God is it, fused with the whole world. We, see, we must see him in others, other people, in the natural world, um, in, 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 in the cosmos everything as, as they did in ancient India, ancient China, everybody. But not, uh, it's not a matter of believing does not mean accepting a whole list of propositions. And in fact, that I, what I, sh I forgot to say, remember that definition of God I gave from the Catholic catechism. The catechisms were invented by both Catholic and Protestant leaders after the Reformation. Because the uh, the reformers thought that once you got to the Bible 
and the people got to the Bible, they wouldn't need churches and councils and theologians to tell them what to believe or think. Uh, they'd find it there, clear as day in scripture. But then they found they couldn't agree with one another about what scripture said. They had terrible quarrels. And from the mo that moment, the movement was split. I mean, uh, they couldn't agree about uh, infant baptism for another one thing. They couldn't agree uh, because scripture says has nothing particular to say about it. They couldn't agree on the Eucharist. What was the Eucharist? Uh, how to interpret that? Scripture, as I said, does not give us those kind of answers. Um, and so where, and where Luther had thought, said everybody should read the Bible at the beginning of the Reformation, all a simple peasant with a Bible in his hand will uh, be able to know more, just as much as any pope or bishop. He had to change his tune during the Peasants' War, when Luther was not on the side of the peasants, he, uh, and he told the princes uh, that the peasants, that the princes, that, that they should go in and slaughter them, the, peas the revolting peasants. The, but they, but they, he also, the peasants, ha ha at the t they, he told the peasants, you must uh, accept, turn the other cheek when you're, and you must obey scripture. But they had the temerity to answer back because they'd read scripture too. And so they said, but Christ has made all men free. And Luther, nonplussed by that, he said, no one should read scripture um, <laughs> ex unless you can read them in the original languages, uh, in Greek or in Hebrew. Otherwise, you'd have to have they, so both. Uh, but they, so they, they created these catechisms uh, in both the Catholic and the Protestant denominations as filters, which would enable you uh, to give you the right doctrines like that: what is God, like the Supreme Spirit, etc. So you would bring that knowledge of you to, to Scripture and read it through the lens of Scripture. Uh, speaking about your last appearance with us remembering, you said the afterlife is mainly uh, something Christianity and Islam focuses on. Does the prospect that there might not be an afterlife worry you? No. No. For me, because I, as I explained in, in, in this lecture, um, the afterlife was a real problem for me. As I was convinced I wasn't going to make it to the good place as a child, um, and, um, and this, con this focus on getting into heaven so that the whole thing was all about me, it was like, it, it's affected me quite badly, like a, a bad sexual experience. This was a bad uh, religious experience. Um, and, um, you know, and I thought, well, if I went into a convent, I'd become, I'd certainly get in, you know, that way. But I realized that that wasn't quite right either. And so now I, I can see that it doesn't have to be like that. Belief in the afterlife or, ex or the, the expectation of afterlife doesn't have to be like this. Uh, but I had it, I, I had, I'm not saying that's the fault of the Catholic Church or of nuns particularly, I just was a concatenation of personnel who were giving me this kind of limited view of religion. So I, for me, I just have to leave the afterlife alone. And uh, what I think we can do is to live now in the present as fully as one can and make the world a better place here now. Two more questions. Um, I'm curious how you found yourself. You said you didn't achieve success until you were 50 years old. Was scripture a factor in your ultimate success? What, no. is, what is your career advice? Uh, n n no, uh, no, it wasn't. Um, I, everything I did collapsed after seven, every seven years. Uh, I was a nun for seven years, left, having had a breakdown, and it was a real wreck. Then I went to Oxford, and I wanted to, and I did well in my first degree, and I wanted to become an academic teaching English literature, so I did a PhD and failed it. 
Now, it's very difficult. It's a great skill to fail a PhD at Oxford because uh, you're not supposed to fail it. Uh, and it, they give you a better, uh, they point out how you could improve things. Well, I had an examiner who, uh, from outside Oxford, who wrote, and if you f do fail a thesis, you've got to write quite a point by point. As, anyway, he wrote four lines saying, I was a very clever young woman, but that in his view, this was not a, a PhD subject. Well, the faculty went apeshit <laughs> and, um, and said that he would never be invited to uh, examine for Oxford again, but now what to do with Miss Armstrong? <clears throat> um, and uh, it was they argued about it for five months. And then they decided I couldn't have it re-examined because it would, at least the uh, half of them did, it split the faculty completely down the middle and th there was a the student body was in turmoil about it uh, because they said it, if they had, it, had it re-examined, it would vitiate the sanctity of the Oxford doctorate. Mm. And she, the woman said, the, 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 she said she was very sorry for Miss Armstrong and injustice had to be done, had, uh, it was an injustice had been done, but uh, the, the sanctity of the doctorate became first. So that was the end of my academic career. Um, I then became a school teacher, and uh, seven years later, I lost it because of ill health. Then I got into television. Um, I was rung up by uh, Channel 4, which was just starting up, who uh, asked me if I'd like to write and present a, a six-part documentary on St. Paul. So yes, I said I was completely out of work. And they'd see, I'd written my first book about being a nun at that time. And, and so this producer had seen me on TV. So he said, would you? So I said, yes, I did. And it was a success. And I did some more television programs. But then I worked with a television company who embezzled all the money that Channel 4 had given them for, the, for, the project, for another project on the crusade. So that, I was tarred by association and went off into, by this time I was nearly 50. Um, and everything I did seemed to collapse. Um, and then I was living alone and all my friends in the television world had fallen away. There was no one to egg me on to be outrageous. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the text started to speak to me in a different way. And I think I was talking earlier about the science of compassion to some of you. Uh, I, that the, I, I was trying to write religious history. My first books were very, very skeptical and angry. But uh, this, I found a footnote which said that you must practice, the, a historian of religion must practice the science of compassion, which didn't mean feeling sorry for the people of the past, but to feel with them. And that you had, a historian must recreate all the, um, you can't look, back, look at the spiritualities of the past from the vantage point of rationalism today, but you must look at what was happening at that time when that spirituality was produced, where, the, where you were looking at it, the econo what, what, the eco what was the economy like? What was the environment like? What were the politics? What was the state of the health uh, situation, medicine, etc.? Uh, what dangers did people face? And not leave that sp spirituality uh, without asking continually, but why and why? and not leave it until you could imagine yourself in these circumstances feeling the same. In this way, he said, you will uh, broaden your horizons and make a place for the other in your mind and heart. And that completely changed the way I saw the spiritualities of the past, because you're putting yourself to one side. That's what, uh, you, you have to leave, clever, over-educated Karen on one side and enter into, which we're writing about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, a world of terror in, and deprivation in 7th century Arabia mm. and not and see that that's where uh, this spirituality comes from um, and, 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 apply, and, and leave yourself behind. It's a form of ecstasy. So it was that, really that sort of brought me back to 
religion, the, not, ju not just a text, but learning to read a text in a, a less selfish way. Uh, what are you hoping for? You spent an intense life searching for answers. You found some, shared insights in great books, spoken around the world. What are you hoping for? Oh, at the moment, I'm finding very little for hope for anything. I, I turn on the television news with Brexit going on night and day, and, and horrifying news from outside the world, all around the world, and how heartless we all are about it, and how we shut out pain. And um, but then there are good people that you meet. And on my travels, I meet good people. And uh, I would just, I, I haven't much hope at the moment, I have to say. Um, but I, I think if we could own, if we could take our religions more seriously, which point to, so that it, it's not all about me or my nation or my church or my denomination, but it's about suffering, muddled human beings um, who, um, who have moments of cru horrible cruelty, but who can also imagine great, the arts, the music, the, or everything that goes into those transcendent moments that we all have. And there are good people you meet around that, you know, that surprise you. Uh, just uh, that, you know, acts of, of sheer kindness sometimes. And when I go to some countries, when I go, to, say, to Pakistan, well, Singapore, which I, I always thought was a rather sort of brash place, you know, with skyscrapers and the new, but the love with which I was treated, um, I, the, you know, they had to hold people off me, uh, whereas it doesn't happen at home, I have to tell you. Um, <laughs> uh, and, 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 I mean, my best friends don't read my books at home, uh, but, but, uh, but that kind of love and openness, and letting me talk to them about their religion. Mm. Uh, that gives me hope. Uh, that, that, that even, in, you know, when, uh, you know, they, the, the things are difficult and bad, that people open their hearts. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and there is love and, and a desire to move forward. And, and, and make the world a more compassionate place. I have a gift oh. for you. It's a clock because we like to say it's oh. our time. It's engraved with your name tonight's uh, event. Thank you for a beautiful evening, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.